Hey guys, my name's Pocket and welcome back to League 101. Today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at Malzahar. We're mostly going to be looking at mid lane, but I do a lot of talking about top lane Malzahar in my mobile fire guide, which you should totally check out. And if you've got any questions for me, then you should hop into my Twitch. I'm live every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. As you can see, there are timestamps in the video description, so you can skip to wherever you need to be if you want to see something specific and we're just going to get straight into it. So first up, we're going to go over Malzahar's abilities and his passive so you can get a really good grip on exactly what Malzahar is and what he can do. Malzahar's passive is Void Shift. Void Shift gives Malzahar a spell shield if he's not taken any damage from non-minions or crowd control in the last 30, 24, 18 or 12 seconds based on his level. Unfortunately, as you may already know, spell shields are incredibly inconsistent in League, so I'm going to go over exactly what Malzahar's spell shield can and can't do. Malzahar's spell shield makes him immune to crowd control and makes him take 90% reduced damage, lingering for 0.25 seconds after either taking damage or blocking a crowd control effect. This means that it doesn't work in quite the same way as you might be used to from Edge of Night on AD Assassins or Banshee's Veil vale on AP Champions, but once you play Malzahar a bit, you'll get used to this really easily. The important thing to note here is that while it will block the full effects of a crowd control ability, it will not block the full damage and you will still take a small 10% chunk of that damage. Malzahar's Q is Call of the Void. When activated, Malzahar summons two portals which then join up, dealing damage and silencing every enemy that's hit between them. There is a 0.4 second delay between summoning the portals and the damage being taken and the silence being applied. And this is a fairly unique ability, so I really suggest you hop in the practice tool and really just run around and try this out. Try it on some jungle camps and maybe some moving enemies and just really try and get to grips with it. Like I said, it's unique, but it's not the hardest thing in the world to get to grips with. And we're going to talk about how to use it and in what way you can use it on specific champions a little later on. Typically, this will be the last basic ability that you level at level 3, but it will be the second basic ability that you max because its silence duration scales with level with double the duration at level 5 compared to level 1. And this means at level 13, when you can max your second ability, that you have a 2 second AoE silence, which is really strong. Malzahar's W is Void Swarm. Malzahar gains a stack of Zrot Swarm when he casts any other ability than his W, up to a maximum of 2. Then, when he casts his W, he gains 1 Voidling, plus 1 Voidling for each stack consumed. This gives him up to 3 Voidlings, which will then attack enemies. Voidlings deal magic damage with their basic attacks, they deal 50% damage to epic monsters, and 300% damage against minions affected by Malefic Visions, which is Malzahar's E that we'll talk about next. While they won't do any extra damage to non-minions that are affected by your Malefic Visions, they will prefer to attack them, which makes it really good for combos. Void Swarm is usually the second ability that you level at level 2, but it is the last ability that you max. This is because it doesn't get any extra cooldown reduction with level scaling, and it actually costs more mana as you level it up, and the minion duration only increases from 8 to 10 seconds. So really, it's just not worth it to level this up over your Q or your E. As we said, Malzahar's E is Malefic Visions. This is a targeted ability, and when used on an enemy champion, minion, or monster, it infects them with Malefic Visions. When infected, they take magic damage every half second over 4 seconds. Damaging the target with Q, Call of the Void, or your ult, Never Grasp, will refresh the duration of the Malefic Visions. If the target dies while infected, they pass Malefic Visions onto the closest enemy, refreshing the duration and restoring 2% of Malzahar's maximum mana. This ability is the bread and butter of Malzahar's kit, and it is the first ability that you will level at level 1, and also the first ability that you will max. This is because its cooldown goes from 15 seconds to 7 over the 5 levels that you level it up, and also its base damage goes from 80 to 220. Therefore, it has the best scaling with level, so it's always the ability that you want to max first. Understanding how to push waves and CS properly with this is absolutely mandatory. So once again, if you haven't tried Malzahar before, I suggest you hop in the practice tool and just try to take a few waves with this so you understand how it works, how it transfers over, and what you're really dealing with so you can maximize your CS when you hop into a real game. Malzahar's ult is Never Grasp. This is a targeted ability, and when used on an enemy champion, they are knocked down, tethered to Malzahar, and then suppressed for 2.5 seconds. 
They are also revealed, showing their location no matter the vision status, and they are dealt magic damage every 0.25 seconds. While cleansing will remove the suppression, it will not remove the tether and Malzahar will continue to channel and deal damage at the target location. On top of this, a null zone is opened beneath the target that lasts 5 seconds, dealing magic damage every 0.5 seconds to every enemy within it. The null zone will persist even if the ability itself is interrupted. This 2.5 second suppression is absolutely massive and it makes Malzahar an absolute monster in 2v1 situations where you have a teammate that can back up your CC and delete the enemy. This makes Malzahar really good at roaming into other lanes, but also really good at accepting ganks from active junglers. Being a suppression, very few things can actually cause people to be able to get out of this, and it usually involves them sacrificing a summoner spell or building a separate build path just for you, which is really, really good. My typical room page for Malzahar starts off in Sorcery, where we'll take the keystone Summon Airy. Airy is a great keystone for Malzahar because he does a lot of damage over time ability effects, and so he'll be able to reproc Airy even in relatively short trades for maximum damage. Also, Malzahar's only way to immobilize the enemy is with his ult, and that means that when you're poking in lane, Enemy champions that are very mobile or even ones that have just bought boots are often able to get out of Arcane Comet. So even though Arcane Comet would do more damage, Airy is definite damage that you're going to proc 100% of the time that you attack an enemy champion. Also, Airy will proc off basic attacks, so into melee matchups, this is even better for poking. Of course, being in Sorcery, that gives us access to great runes such as Mana Flow Band and Transcendence, which are really good on Malzahar. Mana Flow Band helps you to keep up your ability spam by increasing your mana regeneration and your maximum mana pool, which is really, really good. And Transcendence is really good because Malzahar loves cooldown reduction. Like I said, you're going to be kind of spamming abilities. You want to be a battle mage, meaning that you're doing sustained damage over time, not really bursting like, for example, an Annie. And so Transcendence really helps you keep up with that. Lastly, in the sorcery line, we'll either take Scorch or Gathering Storm. Now, this really depends on your playstyle. Scorch is much more lane dominant, and Gathering Storm is better for late game scaling. But basically, I look at it like this. If you are looking to build for a late game scaling, and you're choosing Seraph's Embrace on Malzahar, and we'll talk a bit more about this in a minute, then you should go Gathering Storm. But if you're playing for a more lane focused and dominant position for yourself, then you should definitely go Scorch. It allows you to whittle your enemy down and do a lot more damage in lane and really take control over your backs and forcing them back so you can maximize your CS and get ahead early. So really it depends on what you're looking for in each particular game and also your just personal play style. If you like to scale, then you're going to want to take Gathering Storm. And if you like to dominate your lane, then you're going to want to take Scorch. First up, and my personal usual runes for secondaries on Malzahar, is the Precision Tree with Presence of Mind and Coup de Gras. Presence of Mind not only gives us great mana sustain, but it gives us maximum mana, which synergizes really well with Seraph's Embrace's passive that gives you AP based on maximum mana. Likewise, it's keeping your mana pool healthy, which is great for split pushing. So really, I feel that this is just a great rune for either the split push Malzahar playstyle or the teamfight Malzahar playstyle. Lastly is Coup de Gras. Into particularly tanky team comps, you could take cut down, but because you're going to be building a lot of health on Leandris, Morellos, Rylai's, um, maybe even Rod of Ages, you don't really want to take that because you're going to be nuking your own damage every time you build health, and that's a bad thing, of course. Our next secondary tree is Inspiration. Now, this is better if you've got, say, a very inactive jungler, so you're not expecting to need your ult very often, and maybe if you're into a particularly hard matchup. This gives us access to magical footwear for free boots, which saves us 300 gold, and also the boots give you an extra 10 movement speed, which is awesome, and cosmic insight. Like we said, Malzahar loves cooldown reduction, you can spam your abilities even more, so these are just great runes. Into really, really hard matchups, you can take biscuits, and that will give you a little extra sustain in lane, but personally, I wouldn't suggest it. I like magical footwear and cosmic insight. And our last secondary tree, and personally something that I take all the time on top lane, but only on top lane, is the Domination Keystones. In this secondary tree, I take Full Sustain, which means Taste of Blood and Ravenous Hunter. These allow me as a top lane Malzahar to take full control of my backs, especially when it's combined with Teleport on my Summoner spell, and really allows me to maximize my CS and just outscale my opponent. 
Taste of Blood works really well with Malzahar because of his damage over time, because Taste of Blood doesn't proc when you use an ability, just whenever you damage somebody. So that damage over time will continue to proc it if you're continuing to do damage. Also, because Malzahar is great at shoving, great at roaming, and great at receiving ganks, it means that he often, especially with the use of teleport, can get around the map and really just secure a lot of kills and stack that Ravenous Hunter quite quickly. Like I said, I take these runes every time on top lane, but only on top lane, because I think the sustain is only necessary on that long top lane where you're going to be wanting to survive and just simply outscale. And finally, for the sub runes, we will either take double adaptive force and then a defensive option to suit the enemy team comp, or we will take cooldown reduction, adaptive force, and then a defensive choice to suit. To choose between adaptive force or cooldown reduction on your first sub rune, you should just look at whether or not you're a scaling build or a damage early game dominant build. If you're building Ludens and using Scorch, take that adaptive force. But if you're building Seraphs and using Gathering Storm, take the cooldown reduction. It outscales the adaptive force when you max Transcendence at only level 9, which is really awesome. And if you're in a full damage but scaling build, so you're not building Zonyas and you're not building Banshee's Veil, and you're not building any other cooldown, then this helps you max your cooldown reduction when you otherwise wouldn't have. So let's talk about itemization on Malzahar. Firstly, boots. Your core boots are Sorcerer's Shoes. These give you magic penetration, more damage, and are just overall the core must-have boots on Malzahar. The only time that I won't build Sorcerer's Shoes is when the enemy is full AD and I'll take Ninja Tabby, which is actually quite common at the moment, or if the enemy is full AP, which is actually quite rare at the moment, at which point I'll take Mercury Treads. This is something that I see a lot with lower level players, they are not willing to take that ninja tabby when the enemy team is full AD because even if they have got quite ahead they think sorcerer shoes are the best option and frankly I just think that they're definitely not. By nerfing your damage just a little bit you absolutely nuke the enemy team especially if they really are a full 5 AD comp so you must be considering this every game if you're going into heavy AD comps. I personally find Merc Treads are only good if you're into full AP comps and I never build them just for the tenacity because I simply don't feel like it's worthwhile on Malzahar. Of course, you're going to be able to know what's killing you and what's going on in the game, so itemize accordingly, your games could be going different to mine and you need to be thinking about the fact that maybe they are locking you down but they're not killing you quickly and maybe that tenacity would help. So really, you just got to be thinking for yourself and itemizing on the fly. So when you're dead, when you're back at base, just take a little bit of time to think about what's going wrong and what's going right and how these boot choices can help you. The next big question on Malzahar is Seraph's Embrace versus Luden's Echo. I know a lot of people will already have a preference with this. They'll have either decided that Luden's Echo is what they want to build or Seraph's Embrace is what they want to build. And it's something that I really think that you need to be thinking of dynamically and you need to be thinking of the pros and cons of each and the team comps and your synergies with your allies and your matchups with the enemies so that you can choose these on the fly. I think it's all too common for people to just set their sights on one of them and only pick it and I think it's a big mistake. So I'm going to take you over what Saras Embrace is good for and what Ludens is good for and of course what they're both bad for and really try and help you figure out how you can decide each game, maybe even in champ select, but each game how to build the right item. So as we have talked about a little bit, Seraph's Embrace is the scaling option. It offers great late game AP bonuses and also a protective active, which is really good, but it doesn't have the extra wave clear that Ludens has, and it has a bit of a worse build path. On the other hand though, it does pretty much completely solve mana issues on Malzahar, which is really, really awesome. Ludens helps to solve your mana issues by giving you a bit of maximum mana, but it's nothing near what Seraph's Embrace offers. And especially if you're playing heavy split pushing style, then you're gonna need to be spamming your abilities, shoving those waves in as much as possible, countering the enemy split push, and you're gonna be running low on mana, even with Ludens, I find. So Seraph's Embrace is great if you're expecting to play for the late game, or if you're expecting to play for the split push. Luden's Echo though, like I said, it offers you better wave clear with its passive, has a better build path, and obviously you unlock all of the Luden's Echo damage and all of the Luden's Echo benefits straight away. 
So this is just really awesome. If you need to get ahead in lane, let's say you're going up against somebody that's inherently gonna outscale you like a Kassadin, then you need your Luden's Echo because you need to get ahead early. You need every advantage you can get. As we mentioned a little bit in the rune section, this works really good with Scorch and Seraphs works really good with Gathering Storm. So now that you know a little bit more about those two items, let's talk about Malzahar's core items after you've chosen a lost chapter item. First up is Rylai's Crystal Scepter. Rylai's is a great item on Malzahar. It's got great base stats with a whopping 90 AP and it has some health, which is desirable on such a squishy champion. But what really makes it shine is its passive ability to slow people. Like we said, Malzahar is a battle mage, which means he's doing consistent and persistent overtime damage. This means that with Rylai's, you're doing consistent and persistent overtime slowing. And that's just really good. It's great in team fights. It's great in lane. It's just an overall great benefit to a champion that has an ability set like Malzahar. It also gives you a bit of utility that really helps your team out, and that's not to be laughed at. The second core item and the much higher damage item, but something that you might want to get after or before Rhyalize, depending on the game, you're really going to have to decide here, is Leandri's Torment. This is a great item on any damage over time champion like Malzahar, and you should always be considering it, if not just buying it every game. This item gives a nice amount of AP and some health and even a burn effect, but what really makes it so good on damage over time champions is the passive Madness. Madness increases your damage up to 10% based on how long you've been in combat. So on a damage over time champion with consistent damage output like Malzahar, it means that you can be consistently max stacked on it and doing effectively 10% more damage than you would have been without it. Where it really comes into its own is into high HP enemy team comps, such as big brawlers that are building defensively or tanks. Combined with Void Staff, you can be a tank melter if you get ahead, and it's just a really great item onto those kind of team comps. If the enemy is particularly squishy or immobile though, then Rylize is definitely going to be what you want first, and then maybe even moving on to some of the other things before you get Leandries. But like I said, I would suggest thinking about this and probably buying it every game at some point. So I'd say the biggest thing to take away for Leandries Torment is editing when you build it, not if you build it. The last core item for Malzahar is Rabadon's Death Cap. Now, this is a very late item, and you may well be building multiple situational items before this, but Rabadon's Death Cap is an absolute must on Malzahar at some point. Once you have a couple of items like Rylai's and Leandri's, and then maybe even a situational item, Rabadon's gives you a huge boost to AP because it gives you 40% extra AP on top of all the AP that you've already built. It does leave you very squishy and it doesn't have a lot of utility, so it's not the best item in the world, but once you get a few items, it just becomes huge and it's an absolute must buy. So I would suggest building this every game, but sometimes it's gonna wanna be your last item. This differs from how burst mages may build because often Rabadon's is a second item or maybe a second and a half item after they build Oblivion Orb. However, on Malzahar specifically, there's so many items with great passives and great utility that synergize really well with his kit, like Rylai's and Leandri's, that it means that you should definitely be thinking about Rabadon's after those things. Also, due to your squishy nature, but the fact that you want to be doing damage over time, and not just bursting and then potentially dying, the defensive situational options that we're going to talk about in a bit really help out as well. So once again, you might want to delay Rabadon's a bit longer just to get those situational items. So really, you've just got to be thinking about Malzahar's build paths a little differently than you might be used to on, say, a Lux or an Annie who is building a very burst mage path. And last, but definitely not least, we're going to talk about the situational items. Now, while I call these situational, you really do need to be thinking about these every single game, and they are really, really great items, if not a little niche. First up is Void Staff. Void Staff is just fantastic if they build pretty much any magic resist on top of magic resist boots. So if they're building MR, you need to be thinking about Void Staff. The one thing I'll say about Void Staff is that it's not efficient to build its second item unless they've already built something like 60 MR, which they probably haven't. And in that case, you should be going for a utility damage buy like Rylai's or Leandri's before Void Staff. This is because you're gonna need the underlying base damage before the magic penetration will actually matter. Our second situational item, and another very common one in the current meta, is Zonya's Hourglass. 
This is an all-round fantastic item for Malzahar and pretty much any AP champion for a number of reasons and we're going to talk about all of them. Firstly, it gives you a good amount of AP and a nice amount of armor and that's just great. But what really makes it shine is its active ability that allows you to survive certain ults from specifically AD assassins like say Zed or Talon and it can give you a huge amount of survivability and really nuke their burst damage, forcing them to back off you and then you wait to trade again. It can be a total lifesaver, which makes it good in its own right, but another thing that makes Zonya's really good is it has an awesome build path. Into AD mid laners, such as Zed or Talon like we talk about, you can build Seeker's Arm Guard very early on and stack it for a good amount of AP and a good amount of armor as well, while you then build your Ludens or your Archangel Staff. This can be a really important buy, especially into more difficult matchups, so it's something that you should always be considering. Even if you don't want Zonya's first item in full, you can get that Seeker's Arm Guard, then build the rest of your items, and then get your Zonya's finished. Our third situational item, and something that all too often doesn't get built when it really, really needs to be, is Morellonomicon. I think if you're here, you've probably been in the situation where you're playing a champ that just can't build anti-heals, and your team refuses to build it into a Fed Mundo and a Soraka bot lane. It's really, really tilting, and Morello's is your only option as Malzahar to take control of those anti-heals, and especially because you're doing a lot of AoE damage, it can actually be really great on you. So this is something that you should always be thinking about if they have oppressive sustain and you should really be taking it into your own hands because Malzahar really, really can build that anti-heals and apply it to the entire team fight. It's also just a great item into particularly squishy team comps or comps that can't build any extra MR very early on because it gives you some flat magic penetration. Flat magic penetration is more efficient than percentage magic penetration like Void Staff if the enemy don't have MR, and actually Morellos becomes a very high damage item if they have zero MR extra. Much like Zonya's, you can consider building Oblivion Orb to get that magic penetration and get yourself into a good position to do a lot of damage, and then wait to see if their healing becomes oppressive, and if it does, you can finish your Morellos, and if it doesn't, you can just keep that Oblivion Orb in your inventory while you finish other items like Leandries and Rabadons, and then make it into Morellos later on, or even just sell it and build for a higher damage output. And finally, our last item is Dark Seal. This is a very gold efficient item and it gives you the ability to snowball and it's just really good to buy early on. It's also really good into pokey mid laners because if you buy a refillable potion alongside Dark Seal, it gives you a lot of extra sustain in the mid lane, which is really, really awesome. This is because Dark Seal gives you 25% extra healing from potions and that is really something that I think a lot of people overlook just how powerful that can be. Of course, if you start to stack your Dark Seal, you're getting ahead, you're snowballing, you're really strong, you've got to be thinking, can I turn this into a Magi Stole Sealer and really, really start dominating the game? Magi's is a really great item, but of course only when stacked, and it's not quite as gold efficient as Dark Seal once it gets low on stacks, so you need to be thinking about how safe you are, but really it's just a great item if you're ahead, and it's a bad item if you're not. It's that simple. So now we're going to talk about laning phase. To start at levels 1 to 3, this really depends on your matchup and who you're going into. Personally, into easy and even matchups, I like to freeze the lane, pushing back when they push and freezing when they freeze. Don't want to shove into them, but we also don't want them to shove into us. This is because after a big push, there's often a period of kind of downtime in lane, and we don't want this to occur when we hit level 3. What we want is to be able to shove the enemy in right as we hit level 3 with a really big wave and then they'll have to deal with that wave under tower not having the same kind of early game level 3 wave clear that we do and then we'll be able to go off and help at scuttle or maybe even gank top or bot lane. Into the tougher matchups, especially matchups that have a lot of early game kill potential on you, I like to just chill out, let them do whatever they want to do and if they want to shove me in I'll just focus on CSing properly under tower and just really just let them have control of the wave at least until we hit level three. At levels three to five, again, it's matchup dependent. Into those tougher matchups that we were talking about, usually, again, I'll just chill out, let them do what they want. I'll try and push back a little more so I'm not under tower so I can CS better. Especially at level three, you're doing this a lot better. You're gonna have very good wave clear. So just try and keep it in the middle of the lane and don't wanna push in too much if they've got a lot of kill potential on you and just kind of relax and, and focus on your CS. Again, there's not a lot of 
early game heavy matchups that are going to be tough for you that also outscale you. So simply CSing well and not dying is really, really good. Into the easier matchups at level three to five, usually I just keep them shoved in. Make it hard for them to CS by keeping them under tower. You're usually fairly safe at this point, especially into the easier matchups, ones that are less easy to gank or that have big ult power spikes like yourself. And just really just try and pressure them, make them miss as much CS as you can, and just try and get a CS lead. Of course, into any type of matchup, you have to realize that you're quite good at poking as Malzahar and you can do a lot of poke damage and really put them on the back foot so that they can't all in you if that happens or if you get ganked, which is really good, but you don't have a huge amount of kill potential. So you're not normally looking to get a kill unless you're getting a gank. As we approach level six, I'll look to reset the wave. I want to drag them out so that I can give good pings to my jungler. Obviously, as soon as you hit level six, you're fantastic at accepting ganks straight away you have a 2.5 second suppression this is pretty much unmatched at level six in terms of how much cc it is and it can really really help you out if you can drag them out by resetting the wave that is to say you push them under tower and have the wave annihilated before the next one crashes into it then you can bring them out to the middle of the wave when the waves collide again and like i said with good pings to your jungler giving them a lot of information hopefully you'll be able to coax them in for a gank at level six and then you just hit r it's the malzaha special and they will die as we move into the later stages of laning phase usually i'm just shoving them in clearing the wave and then looking to go and be helpful elsewhere really we don't have a huge amount of kill potential on our own like i've said you're great at accepting ganks so good pings to the jungler about summoner spells old cooldowns and other things that have happened in your lane also trying to keep track of the enemy jungler and where he is and just really try and make it so that your jungler can come and help you as much as you can when your ult's off cooldown. As laning phase ends, obviously you're already going to be level 6 and you're going to have an insane amount of wave clear at this point. Even if you've gone for a more scaling build like Saras Embrace, you're simply going to have really really good wave clear and so you're going to be wanting to look towards the side lanes and look towards pushing out and applying map pressure on those side lanes as safely as you can because you've got to remember that you are immobile so it's quite dangerous but you want to push those side lanes out apply map pressure make it so that your team have, has control over objectives like dragon or rift herald and of course into the later mid game baron and yeah just really think about what waves you should be catching and trying to stop the enemy putting pressure on your towers and getting free towers when you could have been there to shove the wave out and just take them out of that tower as we move into the later stages of the mid game and of course into the late game you're going to want to be deciding whether you team fight or whether you split push like we said you're really good at going into the side lanes pushing really quickly applying pressure and also relieving the pressure that they're applying on you and this is really really great strategy for Malzaha. but especially when you're playing a mid lane if you've got a top laner that can do this as well say a trindomir for example who's a fantastic split pusher then you're going to want to be with the team especially if you've already got rylize at this point and you're on a scaling build you can give a lot of damage and a lot of utility to your team and that would just be wasted giving your team a second split pusher so again this is a quite a complex decision you're going to want to be looking at the enemy team your team what's necessary what's your win condition and really trying to make the smartest decision about where you need to be if your team isn't fighting if you scale better and you're trying to just farm up and you're really just trying to survive an early game heavy team comp then obviously just look to cs look to relieve pressure look to split push if you can but once again you're very immobile and you're rather squishy even when you've built these health items like rylize leandries and morella nomicon you're still fairly squishy so don't split push too hard at this stage of the game especially if you're trying to scale because you will just get deleted by the more mobile champions that are going to be able to come up and just catch you out and lastly, we're going to talk about a few little tips and tricks that are really going to help you master Malzaha. These are very small on their own, but they're necessary if you really want to get the most out of it. So firstly, you need to remember that your Voidlings on your W can block anything that a minion can block. So any incoming CC like a Morgana Q or a Lux Q can be blocked by your Voidlings. This means you can use your W to get out of situations when skill shots would otherwise have rooted you and got you killed. Number two, you need to remember that your Q and your ult will reapply your stacks of malefic visions. This means that if you are attacking Drake, Baron, or even champions where you're trying to DPS over an extended period of time, then you need to make sure that you're using your Q as late as you can in order to reapply those stacks of E as late as you can and get the longest period of DPS. 
Of course, if your Q silence is necessary for defensive purposes, then you don't want to prioritize using it for DPS over getting that silence off when you need it. But if you are safe or if you are applying this damage to Dragon or Baron, then using your Q as late as you can during the Malefic Visions on your E means that you'll get the most amount of DPS. You can also use this during Wave Clear. If your E is on a minion but it's not quite going to die before the E runs out, by queuing, you'll reset that Malefic Visions, giving it extra time. You'll also do some damage to help it die, and then you can make sure that that E stack continues to burn through the wave and help you wave clear. Number three, ult combos. Ult combos can seem pretty simple on Malzahar, especially when you've got a teammate or maybe even four to back up your hefty CC, but perfecting your ability order is key to getting the most out of him. Especially considering your low kill potential in lane, when you do go for an ult combo without your team there, you need to maximize your DPS to ensure that you can secure the kill. For the purposes of this section, we're going to assume that you're alone, you've got no team to back up your CC, and that all four of your abilities are off cooldown. So just to be annoying, we're going to start off with the last ability that you use. Ability number four will always be your ultimate. This is because you're unable to perform other actions during the long 2.5 second channel and with your W and E being damage over time abilities while your Q has a fairly low cooldown it's never worth it to save a basic ability until after you ult. Now back to the beginning. Our first ability will be a choice between Q and E. There is no reason to use W first as even if you use second it will still fully stack it for after your combo and E and Q give you immediate damage as well as potentially giving you a little utility on your Q's silence while W will not apply any immediate damage or utility means that it's just not worth using first. So when we decide between starting our combo with Q or E, we generally look at utility versus damage. The earlier you use E, the more damage you will do because it's a damage over time effect. Whereas Q will always have the same amount of damage no matter where it appears in the combo because it's just a single use ability. So if you're certain that you can get your combo off easily, that they're not going to be able to escape and that you just want to maximize your DPS, you'll start with E. Into tougher or more mobile champions that are hard to get your mitts on, then you're going to want to start Q. Q will apply a 1 to 2 second silence as we talked about in the abilities section and that means that it will give you an opening to use all of your abilities and then get your ult off which will maximize your DPS for this combo. While it will do lower DPS than starting with E, it's only mild really and it will ensure that you get your ult off and they don't slip out and that's just really important into certain champions. So effectively, to pick your first ability, you just need to think how easy are they to lock down and choose a first ability accordingly. Now for the last two slots in our combo, rather than thinking what to use second and what to use third, we'll simply consider when we want to use W. If your W has its max two stacks after your first ability, then by using its second, we ensure that it's max stack after our combo, as our third and fourth abilities will apply stacks, and then you'll have your max stacks for your next W after the combo. If it is not max stacked, however, after your first ability, using it third will ensure that we get our maximum three voidlings as our second ability will apply a stack, and then you'll be able to do the most amount of damage while you're ulting them. So to sum it up, you're using W, second or third based on when it reaches its maximum stacks. Once we make that choice, the last ability will simply slot into place, and now we have four ult combos, and hopefully this is going to help you understand exactly when to use them, and exactly why to use them, so that you're going to be able to maximize your efficiency, and really secure kills that might otherwise have gotten away. And we're done. Thank you very much for watching. I really hope it helped you with Malzahar. And if you liked it, then give the video a thumbs up. If you want to see my next guides, then don't forget to subscribe. And check me out on Twitch. I'm live every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we're just a handful of followers away from affiliate and getting our sub button. What do you call a Blitzcrank with a lot of Trinity forces? One expensive hook. Okay, I would definitely not have got that.